Hello, 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 ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to Faith Unaltered. It is that time again. Uh, my name is David Russell, and I'm here with my co-host, the man, the myth, the legend, Tyler Fowler. What's going on, brother? How was your week? Man, my week has been interesting. I'll just leave it at that for right now. But, dude, I'm doing great. I'm excited to have Dr. Marcus Ross with us to talk about some young earth to school you, Mr. David. <laughs> and I'm just, I'm ready to get rocking and rolling, bro. Like, I'm, I'm really excited to have this conversation. So thank you, Dr. Ross. It's an honor. It's a privilege to meet you and to uh, talk uh, with you about these things. Well, I mean, thank you. The honor's mine, guys. Uh, thanks for having me in on your program. This is this is fun. The questions yeah. that you guys sent ahead of time to me, they're stout, man. These these are hard hitting questions. So yeah. I am uh, eager to hear hear them voiced out to see where this conversation goes and uh, to enjoy, you know, a time on the program with you. Thanks. Yeah, we often say this is like great fellowship time, you know, and, and me and Tyler, we love yeah. coming over here and having our guests on and, and we really try to make it about you guys too. So, uh, and we want to get the information out there. I don't know what Tyler's trying to do with the sticky note on his head, but. <laughs> Y-E-C for the win, yo. You got to love it. Uh, and it's yes. really, it's not a sticky so, note. So I had to, I had to Indiana rig this thing. Okay. Like there's some duct tape on the back of this. I cut it out <laughs> and did all, went all arts and crafts. So. Like I said, I'm right proud. I'm, I'm for this right episode, y'all. Hey, like, right, might, might, proud. <laughs> might just want to leave that in Lacey's hands with the arts and crafts, my friend. No, I'm well, <laughs> maybe my daughter could do better. I don't know, but I, I, I know I, mine could do better than me. <laughs> look, we're gonna start making these and selling them, so y'all uh, oh, wait okay. for our merch store. Okay, so. <laughs> right <laughs> on. Can I get a free one of these for you know showing up on the program? Yet? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Free hats for you. Free hats for you. Everyone gets a free everybody hat. gets yeah. free hats. <laughs> right on. Oh. Free. But, you know, I, I'm really excited to have this conversation, too. And, Tyler, before we get into it, uh, throughout this entire series, I just name one one big takeaway that you've got without being like the silly, uh, well, well, young Earth is true. Well, old Earth is true. You know, we could go that route if we wanted to. And I know that's what you're going to do. So, but no, like, seriously, one big takeaway, and I'll share mine. No, fair enough. So the takeaway that I've had throughout this entire series is that I need to study this topic a lot more, period, in the subject. You, Dr. Hugh Ross, and and uh, Rob, Rob Rowe from Sentinel Apologetics, all of you guys have literally like just overwhelmed me with the evidence for, for an old earth, right? Mm -hmm. And so coming into this, I was just young earth is true. There ain't nothing these guys can say, but y'all have brought the evidence to the table. And so I encourage not only myself, right, but all of our listeners, please go back and check out this series. We'll put it in a nice little playlist for you. So you don't even have to search for it. Just click that playlist, watch them in order and really listen to the evidence that David, that Rob, that Dr. Hugh Ross brings to the table because there is really good evidence for, for an old earth. I really, I, I really believe that. And I really, really hope Dr. Marcus Ross squashes it tonight. So we'll, uh, <laughs> Well, uh, uh, that's my takeaway, though. That's my well, take. yeah. Uh, more honestly, yeah, and and for me, you know, I, I've really learned that there could be other approaches to this that mm. that that are valid, and it, it's very it, it's really broadened my my scope, you know, and mm -hmm. you, you know, because when I was a young Earth uh, creationist, you know, that I was kind of like you it was just that, and then I was overwhelmed with with you know, other arguments and, and this and that, and, yeah. you know, slowly I kind of changed my view, but going back and hearing different arguments that I've never even heard, even on my side, I, I didn't, you know, like a Heiser approach or a Theo history approach from uh, Dr. Joseph Miller and right. stuff like that. I mean, it's really, okay, look, there's so many, there's different views out here and I need to investigate even more than what I did in the past, you mm -hmm. know, and that's why, like, I'm so privileged to have Dr. Marcus Ross here. And uh, he's actually the first young earth scholar that I was actually able to get a hold of. A lot of people kind of like, <laughs> we're trying to run away from this discussion. <sighs> I'm telling but, you. Yeah, it was no. tough. And even, mm -hmm. but, you know, to be fair, I did reach out to a lot of intelligent design folks that have an opinion and a say in this and i couldn't they were the same way i couldn't get a hold of them but thankfully we got one of the uh the big guys hugh ross to come on and i'm sure there's no relation there right dr ross no no it's uh it's kind of like church history you know you got uh, ross the elder and ross the younger 
Right. There you go. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Right on. But you you know it, you know we're you know we're just really privileged to have you, uh, Doctor Ross. And if you could just tell the folks in the audience a little bit about yourself, what you do, and your scientific background, and so forth. Yeah, sure. So um, my name is Marcus Ross, and I am a young Earth creationist. My the training in geology and paleontology. I'm a fossils and rocks guy. Um, I got my PhD from the University of Rhode Island in uh, 2006. Uh, before that, I had a master's degree in vertebrate paleontology from the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology. And my undergrad was from good old Penn State University in uh, Happy Valley State College, Pennsylvania. I uh, just met up with a student today who was from there and he was like, what? And I was like, yep. And he said, we are. And I said, Penn State. And he's like, I can't believe finally somebody knows that chant. I'm like, oh, I said that a lot. Uh, so uh, my my academic history, K through PhD, was all in state schools. I, I never spent a day in a Christian religious school until I started teaching at Liberty University. Uh, mm -hmm. I began teaching there in 2005 and uh, taught there for 16 years until uh, May of 2021. And I stepped down from teaching full time. Uh, because a few years before, my wife and I had started up a science supply company kind of on the side in the basement, you know, just doing a little little thing because I thought people wanted, you know, people might want to get geology materials that included some information from a young earth perspective. And uh, so we started uh, and founded Cornerstone Educational Supply. Uh, and due to a junior high uh, age birthday at my house right now. Uh, I am I am in uh, Cornerstone Educational Supply uh, World Headquarters, uh, located about a mile from my house in a in a cool warehouse. And uh, so yeah, we got this is this is our merch right back over here at Cornerstone. Uh, we got rocks, rock, mineral, and fossil kits. We've got biology supplies, chemistry, physics, you know, all that sort of stuff. We make customized kits for things like master books uh, for Berean builders for some colleges and universities. So uh, out of our basement, we've grown up to be a full uh, kind of full service science supply company. And uh, last year, we were kind of looking at it and thinking, I think we can, you know, I can step aside from teaching and, and dedicate my time uh, to building up Cornerstone from here on out. So uh, it's been nice. a little over a year of uh, not teaching full time. And uh, I still teach uh, a little bit adjunct for Liberty University. I, I teach an earth science class to keep that going. And because uh, I'm the only one in town who can teach it. <laughs> So uh, I said, yeah, sure. And uh, being an adjunct is great because it gets me library privileges, which is uh, yeah. really important for uh, scholarship. I continue to work on various topics uh, over the last year in particular. Uh, I've been working on the issues of historical atom and human origins uh, as part of a forthcoming uh, multiple views book published by uh, Broadman and Holman next year. And uh, that has me as a young earth creationist, um, Andrew Loke, uh, who's a philosopher arguing for a genealogical atom, kind of like a Joshua Stormidas view, if you're familiar with him. Um, William Lane Craig uh, is the one who kind of organized this book, and he's got uh, his perspective on atom that he published in a book last year of an ancient atom. Uh, and then Kenton Sparks is uh, the, the fourth individual writing for more of a, uh, a non-historical mythological perspective to atom. So um, my training in paleontology wasn't usually directed towards anthropology. I'm an introvert, so I don't care about people. And, uh, <laughs> and all, all that human fossil stuff and, and whatnot. Um, but I'm, I've uh, been dragged into that uh, initially kind of kicking and screaming, but it's, it's a fascinating, actually, really fascinating discussion. And it's one of the more vibrant ones in science faith issues right now uh, in evangelical Christianity. So that's so you, a quick summary of uh, kind of where I've been, what I've been up to, and what I'm doing now. So are you still around the Lynchburg area? Yep. Yep. Thankfully, so I didn't have such, to. It's such a small world. I'm literally in Fredericksburg. Oh, really? Oh, really? <laughs> yep. yep. That's yep. awesome. That's awesome. Well, uh, I got to talk to Gary Habermas, too, and that was just like amazing thing. So yeah, we got oh, some fantastic. Virginia folk yeah. here and Pennsylvania. I have family from Pennsylvania. So that was, that's pretty cool. But uh, yeah. So like, again, thank you so much for coming here and guys, you heard him. He sells stuff. So we're going to let him plug that again at the end of the show, but we're going to get into some young earth creationist stuff. Now, mm -hmm. Dr. Ross, I know you debated Mike Jones on some of this. How did we, you know, yeah. tell us a little bit about that. Well, that, that was uh, a really interesting uh, debate. I mean, Mike Jones is an excellent debater. Uh, he, he's very well read. Um, he's up on a lot of the current discussion on um, issues in Genesis. He has a like 
15 part series that he's produced on, on Genesis. Um, and so I was asked to debate him at the Capturing Christianity um, conference uh, earlier this summer. And uh, I, I was definitely brought in as kind of the underdog sort of guy. You know, Capturing Christianity leans old earth towards theistic evolution a little bit. It's kind of open on more of those sides of things. Young earth creationism, not considered quite as uh, respectable in their particular view. And um, but uh, I, I got a secret weapon here. And the, the secret weapon is that my sister, another Dr. Ross, uh, Dr. Ross, the the younger, younger, um, she's uh, a year and a half younger than me. <laughs> uh, but Dr. Jillian Ross, who teaches at Liberty University, is an Old Testament scholar. Uh, and so I am able to run through a lot of issues and questions and with her about things so that if I'm going to start talking about what the Hebrew text is, is meaning in certain things or what the biblical text is doing, I, I can check that against a you know, legit Old Testament scholar who's going to say, yeah, you can say that. No, you cannot say that. And by the way, you misspelled this word. So, you know, it's like, yeah. um, and, and so uh, our debate was very, very heavy on textual exegetical issues, uh, which was perhaps surprising when you put a philosopher and a paleontologist in the same room uh, in order to debate it. But um, yeah, Mike, Mike prefers uh, the viewpoint of John Walton overall. Uh, that Genesis is a functional creation, that God is not actually making the material world, but rather God is organizing an existing material world uh, right. to hand it over to, to you know, humanity as part of um, the stewardship and the kind of temple perspective that Walton has on Genesis 1. Uh, and so Mike Jones uh, takes that perspective, and uh, we, went, we went through a lot of rounds uh, on that. And uh, it, was, it was a very good debate. Um, it was long and two hours, and uh, we covered a lot of ground. Uh, I've, hopefully, the audience got uh, some stuff there that they weren't expecting to hear from a young Earth creationist. Right, right. I thought it was a very, very good dialogue that you guys had. It was very cordial, you know. Mm -hmm. And you know, that was a. It was just a, a, a. I thought it was just a great debate overall. So it was, uh, I it was applaud you. Good. Yeah, I, I think I first heard you. You're giving a lecture on young Earth creationism, and I was like, man, I need to get that guy. <laughs> and so, like, uh, yeah. Now we got. Once to. I heard you were available, <laughs> that you actually do these type of things i was like oh yeah okay. he debates and stuff so we could get him on here to ask some questions so yeah I mean, what can i hurt on, let's reach out I'm on twit face and instant you know yeah, instant right. heart, whatever all that no i don't they call it you twit face right like the youtube Ooh, yeah you, YouTube, twit twitter, twitter <laughs> yeah and facebook <laughs> and that's Instagram. that sounds pretty good and you <laughs> mentioned uh, dr hugh ross uh and right. uh, actually dr hugh ross and i had a debate back in 2016 Oh wow! Uh, at Evangel University. So the lecture that you saw me give may I don't, I'm not sure, but uh, there was a lecture that I gave there that was posted. They filmed our debate and it never got put online, which was oh, really wow. disappointing. That's a uh, sin. Oh, it was. It, I mean, it was. We had a we had a very gr good discussion. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Hugh Ross is quite a gentleman. He's he's a delightful man. He's he is, very he very nice. Um, and, and we had a, a really good, you know, dialogue, chat, interaction with the audience. So I think it, it was a shame that it never made it on, uh, made it on YouTube. I mean, Ross, somebody dropped the ball. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. Who, who, I mean, you have a chance to have Ross versus Ross. I mean, come on. Man. Yeah. Now, I mean, Ross won. So you know, <laughs> no way around that one. <laughs> right. We might have to have a right part on. two kind of informal discussion with, since that never did make it online, you know, this channel is always open to having that. And we'll yeah. actually put it online. So yeah, if yeah. Are it will right. actually be yeah. online. That's <laughs> right. That's right. Because Tyler's actually in Indiana. So I am. But yeah. I am very but, nice. yeah. So yeah. Dr. Ross, as a paleontologist, you know, um, can you just give us a rundown of your view and, and stuff like that from a young earth perspective, you know, a scholarly sure. view? Yeah. So uh, obviously young earth creationism is overall a perspective that has, um, uh, argue that the Earth's age is measured in thousands of years rather than billion, you know, 4.55 billion is the typical age that's given in geology. And most young Earth creationists will say the Earth is about 6,000 years old. I'm not tied to Usher's chronology in any particular way, um, but the, the Earth's age is finite. Um, it's recent and it begins effectively with the creation of all things and people that it, Earth history and human history, you know, basically are only different by five days. Um, 
And so young earth creationists look at the text of Genesis, interpret the days of Genesis as actual days rather than ages or analogies or something like that. Um, and of course, uh, a global flood is uh, a major, major component of young earth creationism, a big way in which young earth creationism differs from most other perspectives. Uh, young earth creationists would argue that a, a large quantity of the geological record that contains fossils was formed during Noah's flood. Now, was it all of, you know, basically all of it, or was it, you know, this much or that much, or, you know, where do you draw the lines? There's arguments within young earth creationism about that, but all young earth creationists are going to agree that there is a significant quantity of the fossil record uh, that was formed during the flood. Uh, in contrast to old earth and theistic evolution or agnostic atheistic evolution perspectives uh, that say that the same fossil record was formed by, you know, standard geological processes operating over hundreds of millions of years. And in the history of the church, young earth creationism was pretty much the only perspective around until the late 18th century, the early, uh, the, the late 1700s. And it's really in the early 1800s that you start seeing the very first theological uh, maneuvers being made by Christians to try and accommodate an ancient age of the earth. So modern young earth creationism, which had a, a resurgence beginning in the 1960s, has sought to reapply itself to these questions of geology, of uh, the age of the earth, uh, biblical scholarship as well, and say that the historical uh, claim of a young earth and a global flood um, are in fact correct. So for me as a paleontologist, uh, that means looking at the geological record, not as the record of life over time, which is what it's usually called, but really as the record of death in a very short period of time that most of the geological record um, is produced during Noah's flood. Um, and, you know, that means that biological evolution or the, ev the evidences that are purported to exist for biological evolution aren't biological evolution at all. The different layers that have different types of organisms are reflecting uh, different stages of the flood as it continues to move its way upward through a variety of different ecosystems and habitats um, from early in the flood to late, you know, or middle of the flood, uh, and then the subsequent uh, draining off of the continents and shaping the modern landscape. So in geology and paleontology, we have an uphill battle, right? I mean, old earth geological arguments and uh, evolutionary arguments from paleontology have been around now for 150, 250 years, depending on you know what you're looking at. And young earth creationist uh, approaches from a scientific perspective are mostly about 60 years old and less. Um, and, and even though Whitcomb and Morris with the Genesis flood uh, put together kind of a superstructure, a paradigm, if you will, of how to approach uh, young earth creationism from a scientific perspective, it would still be a couple of decades before the very first PhD trained geologist would come on the scene for young earth creationism. Uh, and that would be Steve Austin, uh, who started working at the Institute for Creation Research about 1980. So you got 1961, the, the Genesis flood is, is written, but there's still no geologist in young earth creationism for 20 years. Uh, wow. And then after that, it's, it's a slow, steady trickle. Uh, Kurt Wise uh, graduates from Harvard in the 19, uh, late 1980s. Uh, starts working at Bryan College at the time. Uh, you have a few other people. Andrew Snelling gets PhD um, in the early 2000s. I do. You've got people like Art Chadwick and Leonard Brand uh, who had been working. They were biologists who kind of turned their attention to geology and paleontology. Uh, and now you've got a, a good number of others. We have a Creation Geology Society uh, that probably has 40 members or so in it that have at least a master's degree in geology and a significant pipeline of students actually uh, that are working their way through undergraduate and graduate programs. So uh, younger creationism has been able to attract uh, a number of people over the, the decades to the point where we've got people who specialize in petrology and paleontology. We've got people who are sedimentologists and hard rock geologists, which is like igneous and metamorphic stuff. Uh, we have some people who have got interest in geochemistry and others that are into uh, um, computer modeling of the Earth's mantle and the crust. So, you know, we're starting to get to the point where we've, you know, you don't have to be a, a jack of all trades. I'd like to be a jack of like eight. Um, and, you know, <laughs> continue to whittle jack that. Some trades. Yeah. Yeah. But the days, the days of a young Earth creationist who's going to be able to speak authoritatively 
um, mm -hmm. on all manner, you know, of, of topics um, is, is thankfully coming to the end. And it's not that, you know, a bunch of us can't talk well about topics. Uh, I taught for seven, for 16 years at Liberty University. And one of the classes I taught was our general survey of creation evolution uh, called history of life. And right. so, you know, that was something where we had to talk about philosophy and theology and a whole bunch of different areas of the sciences. Uh, so you do have to get yourself knowledgeable. But, you know, even though I can talk about what's going on with Hebrew and Genesis one, I'm not calling myself a biblical scholar. I'm not talking, you know, I, I don't read Hebrew. I'm not a Hebraist, that sort of thing. So uh, I'll stay partially in my own lane, but I will I will migrate around a little bit like it's uh, dark and late at night. Right. All right. Right on. Tyler, you want to follow up with anything on that? I just I, I like how you said that for the majority of church history, right? Young Earth creation, it's kind of the uh, the, the thing everybody believes. Right. And, and you even see this today as you ask any Jew. And I brought this up, you know, a couple of times on the show. But you ask any Jew, hey, what year is it? They're going to say five thousand seven hundred eighty two. Right. And that goes all the way back to creation. And so it really doesn't start being challenged until the modern view of science and how we look at the data that the earth and that God gives us, right, to interpret these different things. Is, is that correct? Yeah. And, and it's the, um, at the time, the burgeoning field of geology and astronomy that offer the two biggest challenges in the uh, late 17 and early 1800s to a young earth, uh, to the point by the time that you're in the, the early 1800s, uh, the, the major learning centers that are out there um, are are leaning towards an old earth. Um, right. They're not thinking about humans as being ancient yet. That won't come around until another 50 plus years with the discovery of uh, Cro-Magnon man and Neanderthals in the 1860s and things like that. So it was sure. really interesting period of time from the late 1700s to the mid 1800s where the, the church was shifting to an old earth view, but humanity was still young. Uh, and there was this kind of thought, maybe the, maybe there's still a global flood. And then eventually that kind of evaporates as they took all this geology and eventually just kept adding more and more age and more and more age and said, well, maybe the flood's only this much, this much, this much. They got to the very top of the geological column, you know, basically looking at the dirt under our feet and like, well, the dirt here doesn't look anything like the dirt in Israel, which doesn't look like the dirt in Indiana, you know, mm -hmm. so there doesn't seem to be ev evidence of the flood. And so the flood evaporated by losing the bottom um, to old old ages, to the idea that God had created different worlds and different realms and different creatures, mm -hmm. either through um, a gap theory style approach or a day age kind of approach. But both of those were saying that there were progressive creations over time. And uh, as a result, they uh, basically obliterated what I think is the evidence for the flood itself. And they were left with the top layers, which at least the very top stuff, all young earth creationists recognize as being post flood. You know, right. the, the geology of the flood doesn't go immediately up to the top. It, there's some point where we've got local post flood processes going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Just out of curiosity, being a geologist, paleontologist, what do you think about the hadrosaur that uh, they found? I think it was up in Canada. It was uh, Brian Pickles and Caleb Brown. Uh, have you heard anything about that? It's still got soft tissue. There's there. I mean, there's a beautiful, like it's, very well preserved the skin is still intact yeah. and they think they're thinking that this might be i don't know if they've excavated it yet fully or not but they're thinking that this might actually be a full uh hadrosaur that they have there do you, do you know what i'm talking about yeah yeah i saw the news reports i haven't uh i haven't read too deeply on it and okay. Uh, but the, the preservation right they're, they're saying that this thing is absolutely amazing basically mm -hmm. you've got a mummified animal uh, yeah. that's been preserved. And in this case, when they're talking about soft tissue preservation, what they really mean is, is not that the original material is still preserved, but rather okay. that impressions and mineralogical replacement has been done at such a fine level that it has even replaced soft tissues so that we can still identify what they were uh, oh, wow. from the original one. Whereas there are other situations like uh, the famous Tyrannosaurus rex that Mary Schweitzer and colleagues had um, yes. excavated and described. And later on, another duck-billed dinosaur from another layer in Montana further down that they also worked on uh, that actually preserves original soft tissue materials, not, pres uh, not impressions, not mineral replacements, but the actual original tissues of blood vessels, blood cells, intact proteins, things like that. That is, wow. is certainly 
where the most exciting and interesting situations are, particularly for a young Earth approach, because these biological mo molecules have relatively known um, horizons for existence. Mm. You know, they, they can exist and persist for a certain period of time, but the laws of thermodynamics are working against them. You've got complexity, and thermodynamics has a tendency to rip apart complexity and bring it towards a lower energetic state. Right. Uh, there's a difference, and this is something that comes up in creation evolution issues from time to time. Uh, order and organization are different, right? Mm. Uh, a mineral crystal or an ice crystal are both very well ordered systems, and mm. they come about simply by thermodynamic processes. If you take warm water and you cool it down, it will form an ordered crystal. But that ordering is very repetitive, right? It's it's H2O matched to H2O matched to H2O, and, it, and it's always ever the same thing, and it builds a particular structure. Mm -hmm. Organization, however, is different. You look inside of a cell, and you don't see order. Mm -hmm. You see order in a sense that the organization is to a purpose. Right. And so we refer to that as order. But uh, if I were to be thinking in terms of information theory, mm -hmm. that order of a crystal is radically different from the organization that we have in uh, cellular tissues, organisms on the whole. So when gotcha. we look at the stuff that's found inside that T-Rex or the, in that uh, Brachylophosaurus, the, the duckbill that uh, Schweitzer described in 2009, um, what you have is still the original organized material. Okay. And it has not broken down despite the fact that it's in temperature regimes and other situations that should make it break down within thousands of years. And right. yet these are materials that are presumably 68 to 80 million years old. And you go, mm -hmm. yeah, these, we, we've got a problem here. And, yeah. uh, and Schweitzer knows that, which is why she's been dedicating the last 20 years almost of her life towards trying to discover a chemistry that would be able to preserve this organization without it breaking down. Right. And uh, she's got some interesting proof of concept stuff, but nothing that actually applies to the real world at this point. I'll just say this and then, David, I'll turn it over to you because I know you got some stuff to say. But the common denominator that I hear from old earth um, advocates is that, well, these types of things, they're in the right place at the right time. And it's just the perfect scenario for these type of things. But you start finding different uh, items like we're discussing in different locations. And it, you, you know, thermodynamics, like you described, is still breaking these things down. There's not anywhere that these uh, items can be preserved for so long that thermodynamics isn't going to touch, right? The second law of entropy and all, and all these different things, right? Yeah. And so it just seems to me like, you know, yes, maybe there is this, you know, perfect Cinderella story, you know, place that these things can be. But once you just keep saying that over and over again, you start, I, I start scratching my head and saying, is that really the way it is? Or are these just things really young? Yeah. And so here's an interesting example from Schweitzer's work is uh, not only were they able to sequence certain vertebrate specific proteins, uh, they did that because they wanted to show that these were the proteins from the organism itself. There were arguments that there were bacteria that had infested the cell and mimicked the original vertebrate material. And so they did protein sequences and found proteins that only vertebrate animals make. So, pro so bacteria are ruled out entirely from this. And uh, what they found is that their samples of these proteins degraded over time in the laboratory when they were placed in a minus 80 freezer for safekeeping. So okay. minus 80 degrees Celsius, right? Mm -hmm. So for us Americans, that's even colder. Really right? cold. <laughs> right, really cold. You're looking at about uh, minus 120, 130 uh, Celsius, maybe no more, uh, sorry, Fahrenheit, a little, little more than that actually. Um, or less than that. So here you put this in a freezer that is as cold as we can keep things basically, uh, in order to keep those molecules from wiggling around and keep them from breaking apart. And they found that their samples degraded over time, even when they were kept in that kind of freezer. Now, hmm. what was the temperature of the fossil when it was in Montana? What, no 80 degrees Celsius. <laughs> 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, couldn't David, quite get you... on that one, David. Oh, oh uh, yeah. yeah like, muted, I, I was going to say, I think it's a certain strain of yeast that actually does it because, you know, yeast 
keeps everything alive. You know, it keeps right. everything going. You know, um, it, it, you know. So no, I'm just joking. I'm, I I make right. wine, so <laughs> I uh, study certain strains of yeast. But no, I'm just joking. Uh -huh. That's how Jesus wrote. I'm just, I'm just joking. Got drunk. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> no, seriously, guys. I mean, it, it's it is truly fascinating, and I, I want to kind of stay on that vein of you know thermodynamics and and you, you know um. That's cool. They did find and things, you know, veins and arteries. So, <laughs> <laughs> right on. Like um, yes. Yeah, so, so you know, like Tyler said, you know, he starts scratching his head after about maybe the fifth or sixth time. You know, I don't know how many times it actually happened, but what yeah. about the loads of other things that we age, such as what do you say about the radiometric dating that concludes some rocks being? 3.8 to 3.9 billion years old. What do you say about those in light of like many different types of radiometric dating? Sure. Yeah. So the, the oldest rocks uh, on the surface of the planet that have ever been dated give us dates somewhere around 3.8 to 4, maybe 4.2, a couple of, of weird ones that we're not really sure. So actually the age of the earth at 4.55 billion years um, is, uh, is dated based on meteor. Uh, material, not by anything that we have um, on on the planet itself. Um, so yeah, uh, radioactive dating is one of the hardest challenges that one can posit to a young Earth creationist like me. It's it's a very difficult problem, uh, right up there with the distant starlight issue. And since I'm not an astronomer, and I didn't, I had enough problems looking at the rocks at my feet. I didn't bother looking at the stars up in the sky. I'll stick with the the rock side of things, uh, and. You know, when I was going through my uh, my graduate program, both master's and PhD, I was known as a young earth creationist to my professors. And so they drilled me hard on this stuff because they didn't want to graduate somebody who, you know, would go out there and they're like, oh, wait, he doesn't know, understand radiometric dating at all. You know, how, how did he get a, a degree? You know, so they held my feet to the fire uh, pretty tough on this stuff. So I had to I had to learn a lot about these different methods. Uh, there's quite a few different ones. Uh, most of the ones that give us the oldest ages are going to be things like uh, uranium dating, whether that's uranium lead or it's uranium uranium or uh, lead series dating. There's a variety of different types that are applied. Um, those are the ones that are used in order to get us usually dates in the uh, hundreds of millions to billions of years. Uh, and the, the physics behind it and the logic behind it is very tight, really, really tight. Uh, young Earth creationists in the past largely said, oh, there's been lots of contamination um, or the dates are just cherry picked uh, the, from, you know, the researchers. They wanted the date to be something like this and they picked the, the one that worked with it. That's not what's going on. That, that's not what's going on at all. Um, yes, geologists do pick particular methods that they think are going to be applicable to a certain rock. So if they're looking at a rock that they already think is very ancient, they're going to exclude a couple of radioactive dating methods that they are gonna look at and say, no, that's gonna give us ages. That only works for younger ages. It doesn't work for the older ones and vice versa. Okay. Um, so I, I'm not one of those creationists is gonna be like, it's a nefarious plot. No, stop it. Just, okay. just stop it. We've heard that and, a couple of times on the channel. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, you know, the reason I ask that is because, like, you know, I have a list, you know, like a huge list here of like several different ages that they that they gather from these different rocks, these different meteorites. And, yeah. you know, it's it's it, it, I could I could buy that that some sort of contamination was going on if it was like maybe two, th maybe three of these rocks and there are yeah. only two or three of these rocks, but there's not, there is a multitude, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's, it's crazy. And that's what I was going to ask you maybe to walk through, but I mean, I, I think I, I understand uh, your answer here. So uh, Tyler, do you want to, yeah, I do. So I want to get your, uh, opinion on this so i've been reading a couple books now mostly by dr jason lyle and he gave a list and i want to say this book is called old earth creationism on trial you can get it from uh, audible and and you can buy the hard copy on amazon if you want to um and i'll post i'll post a link down in the description for anybody that's interested in that but he gives a list of different rocks that we know the dates for like for example mount st helens right we mm -hmm. know when mount st helens erupted we know 
uh, the date for that. We know the dates for all of these different volcanic rocks. And he was making the claim that some of these were radiometric tested and they come up with ridiculous years, like hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. Mm -hmm. you, you obviously know what I'm talking about. So would you like to say anything on those types? Of, is, is, are the, is that true what Dr. Lyle is pointing to? Or is there yeah, a little it, bit of bias there? It, it is true um, okay. that uh, we have historic eruptions that we know happened uh, in the recent past or even in the ancient past. Uh, but, you know, are, are well dated through historical records and people have sampled these and run analyses on them and come up with dates, uh, radiometric dates that are wildly off. You know, so mm -hmm. you get something from Mount St. Helens uh, that we know erupted in May of 1980 and it comes back with an, uh, a potassium argon date of 300,000 years ago. You're like, right. you know, that's that would be wrong. Right. That is yeah, very <laughs> incorrect. So the question is, why did that happen? Mm. So the reason why that happened, if you take a look at the potassium argon method in particular, um, it is used by geologists mostly for things once you get past the threshold of about five to 10 million years. Then after that, they feel comfortable using it because one of the things that happens with uh, some volcanic eruptions is uh, the argon that is gaseous at the time of the eruption is the same argon, it looks identical to the type of argon that is produced by the decay of potassium into argon. So if you have a volcanic eruption and you have a crystal that forms very quickly out of that eruption, right? You have molten material and all of a sudden it forms a crystal. Mm -hmm. It can have in it potassium that will eventually decay into argon, but it will also have inside of it argon that it is inherited from the liquid magma and the lava. And you can't tell the difference. You don't know in that sample what uh, what argon came from radioactive decay and what argon came from uh, inheritance mm -hmm. from argon that was already in there. Right. This is a particular problem for recent geological processes. So uh, because we know that there's a lot of argon in, in these uh, lavas, yeah. if you date something that happened very recently, it's going to give you an old age. And uh, some of the, the ones, there were multiple rocks in uh, Mount St. Helens that had been dated, one of them up to, I think it was 5 million years old yeah. uh, and whatnot. So this does pose a bit of a challenge to the method because if we go then to something that's supposed to be older, that's old enough that the, the radioactive material can swamp whatever original inherited argon was in there, that's still a judgment call of like, well, how do you know how much argon was inherited in the beginning from right. this? You're, accept, you're, you're accepting that there's some, and you think it's a certain level, and that means you have to wait X number of millions of years before that becomes uh, a rounding error, right? That just becomes a, a small instrument error and isn't a huge error like it is in the present. Yeah. And so that's one of the reasons why most geologists who do radioactive dating are gonna shy away from something like potassium argon for recent stuff, because they're like, well, it's not gonna get you a good age if there's any inherited argon at all. Okay. But I think that that does still bring to the question, well, how much argon is there? And we might not actually have enough samples in the present to make any sort of good judgment on that. Mm. And so we could have a lot of dates out there that are incorrect and we don't know it. Because now, we don't have the correct number, the starting number, right? That's gotcha. right. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, you look in, you see this hourglass that's been going down and you say, oh, okay, there's, there's this much. But you don't know, in this case, you don't know if somebody had seeded the bottom of the hourglass with a bunch of sand. Yeah. You're like, oh, okay, so it looks a lot older than what it is. What it really is. Now, hey, you got to, yeah. don't you, don't you have to give the benefit of the doubt to, though, to the people that are testing these things because they run them through a multi layer of tests? And yeah, some of it's going to come back wrong and they know that. So they have to yeah. use another method. And that's why we have such a, a large field of testing, right? Yeah. And so that drawback in the potassium argon method uh, caused a, a scientist to redevelop what he called an argon argon method, uh, where they actually um, use use lasers to uh, change some of the potassium that wouldn't decay into argon. So there's a difference and they, they do a different type of process there. And yeah, these produce graphs and charts and things like that, where you can see different shapes to the graphs and some shapes will indicate to you that there's been contamination. And so mm -hmm. you can see from the graph, this is going to be a bad sample. So we, we aren't, we're not going to deal with that. So, you know, my, my old earth colleagues are not idiots. They, they know what they're doing here. They're very smart, competent individuals. Sure. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why I don't say people are cherry picking the data or, or things like that. Now, 
other methods have other strengths and weaknesses. So for potassium argon, you have this problem where you could have lots of argon, you don't know it. Uranium lead dating or uh, lead lead uh, series dating, those approaches don't have that problem. You know, they, they are a different kettle of fish altogether. Uh, when we take a look at uranium dating, these ones, uh, let's, let's put it this way. Let's say that we wanted to have a really good test to see if these different dating methods agreed with one another, right? Mm -hmm. So we take a single lava flow uh, that should have cooled very quickly based on its size. It's been squeezed in between two uh, sets of, of sedimentary rocks. So it cools pretty quick in between the rocks. Mm -hmm. And uh, that means that most of the rocks uh, or most of the methods should give us pretty much an identical age, overlapping error bars type of thing. Mm -hmm. Right. With the exception of potassium argon, which usually is also very young because the argon is able to keep escaping while the rock is solid but hot. And you have to get to a cooler temperature before the argon gets locked in completely. Okay. So argon, it, it, potassium argon, that's its own thing. So Steve Austin led a group of young earth creationists in an evaluation of one of these types of, of uh, lava, not really a lava flow, but what we call a, um, a sill in between these rocks and used five different dating methods on it. Okay. And ones that all should, you know, if this rock formed, you know, formed and cooled within 1 million years, which probably was even less than that on, even on the conventional time scale, probably would have cooled within a couple hundred thousand years and is Precambrian. So it, it's like 1 billion years old. So 300,000 years, that's not even an error bar, right? Where you can't see that at that point in time. Used five mm -hmm. different methods, and there was up to 1 billion years worth of difference in the ages. No way. Using rubidium strontium, using um, lead, uh, uranium lead, using uh, a variety of others, checking five different methods against one another, and they all came out different. There was a kind of a progression of younger to older ages on these things. Okay. And they've checked that on a couple of others and found that there tends to be this interesting situation where a single unit that should give us a unified date actually gives us several dates depending on which method you happen to be using. And the end members don't overlap on their error bars. So you might have, you know, this error bar and that error bar and that error bar, but eventually you come and it's like, no, these two aren't the same, can't be the same. Right. Right. And I'm not sure what that means yet at this point. I'm not sure anybody knows what it means. Uh, the young earth creationists think that it's an artifact of accelerated nuclear decay, that the rate of radioactive decay was faster during the period of Noah's flood than it was today. And that the, uh, the heavier elements tend to be the ones that are the older ones. So for example, uranium lead dating always gives us the oldest dates and rubidium strontium is always younger and rubidium mm -hmm. is a, a lighter element than uranium mm -hmm. and so it, this could be giving us some sort of artifact for accelerated decay another interesting example of why we think there might have been some sort of accelerated decay comes from the process of uranium decay so when uranium decays into lead it's not a one-to-one -one thing you don't start with uranium and then end up with lead in one shot right. it's actually a very complicated series of events involving over a dozen stages and along the way, you produce eight atoms of helium as the okay. uranium sheds off different bits of itself, keeps yeah. chucking out two protons and two neutrons, and that's helium. Okay. That helium tends to escape because helium is a lightweight, small gas, and it just wiggles its way through everything. Sure. If that's the case, then we can sample uh, a crystal that has uranium lead in it. That uranium lead ratio will tell us how old the crystal is supposed to be on the conventional method, or at least tell us how many uranium atoms became the lead atoms. Right. And from that, we multiply that by eight to get the number of helium atoms that came out okay. of this process. Okay. Sure. So pretty, pretty technically 7.7, .7, but eight, eight works. Rounded right. up. Yeah. <laughs> works for, you know, grocery store math here. For sure. So because helium should uh, escape very quickly, there should be basically no helium in this little crystal. Right. It just wiggles its way out like kids on Pez in the jungle gym. I mean, they're just, they're <laughs> out, right? So young earth creationists, on the other hand, uh, thought, well, if there was a period of accelerated nuclear decay, the helium might still be sticking around. And uh, De, uh, D. Russell Humphreys was the one leading this for what was called the rate team. And he actually predicted 
several years before they got the results back, what the two curves would look like for an old earth and a, uh, for a young earth and an old earth on how much helium would exist. Yeah. Um, he's a, he's a physicist. Mm -hmm. And when they got the results two years later, they fit perfectly onto his plot for young earth. Mm -hmm. It was astonishing because there's, there's, I think it was five orders of magnitude difference in the expected amount of helium between these. I mean, so 10,000 times more helium expected in young earth than in old earth. And the data plotted in just exactly on his, on his line. I think Andrew Snelling, uh, Dr. Andrew Snelling actually pointed or graphed that in his book, millions, not billions, right? Uh, yeah. So thousands, not billions or, or thousands, not billions. Yeah. Yeah. Millions. Thousands, not billions is the, uh, <laughs> yeah, millions, not billions. So we're younger. Not an older, just a like <laughs> older creationist, right? Yeah, I'm earth. glad you converted, Tyler. Thank you. No, That's, right. not at all. <laughs> That's the age of hobbits back there. The, the yes. middle, yeah. earth middle earth. So <laughs> yeah, thousands, that. not billions um, was yeah. the, the lay level explanation of the rate team, radioisotopes in the age of the earth. They had two books that were each like yay thick. And even I have a hard time reading them. They're really really technical works. And so they made this, you know, kind of made for humans sort of version called thousands, not billions. And even that one's difficult. So they made a video to help out with everybody else as well. Um, not the most exciting video to watch, but Hey, um, it, it was all right. It if you want right. the information, it's there. <laughs> it is, it is there. And, uh, and Russ Humphreys was talking about, uh, this in there. So, you know, those are some ways that I like to point out because a lot of times people say, oh, young earth creationism, it's just religion. It's, it's just a religious belief. You guys have no science and uh, or, you know, it's it's anti-science. It's not science. And then these same people will often then try and use science to then say young earth is wrong. It's like, wait a minute. If young earth creationism is purely religious and there's no science to it, then how can there be science against it? Right. So yeah. pick your pick your pill, red or blue. Which do you want? You know, do you want it to be purely religious or do you want it to be something that can make evidential claims? OK, uh, and Christianity, of course, has always been a religion that makes evidential claims. Absolutely. All said, you know, if Jesus has not been raised from the dead, I of all people are most miserable. Right. Hang it up, people. We we bet on the wrong. We're horse. Done. That's right. Right. So I like to point these out as examples where young earth creationists um, came up with a concept, um, a hypothesis, went out and collected data had that data analyzed and they didn't do the, the data analytics on their own. They sent these off to different labs and whatnot to, to get it done. Um, and then came back with interesting results that were often rather surprising compared to what was expected. And so here you've got helium in rocks that are that's saying, I haven't been here very long and a uranium date that's supposed to say, oh, I'm billions of years. So, you know, which are you? Are you billions of years old or thousands of years old? How do you make sense of these two? And the rate team said, you make sense of it by the, by the idea that the uranium was highly accelerated in its decay, and it produced a bunch of this helium quickly, and the helium hasn't had time to escape the crystals yet. And uh, other geologists are going to have to try and make an argument, no, maybe you can infuse the crystal with helium in some way, that's tough to do, actually. They've, they've looked at the geology around these crystals to see if there's helium in it, and the answer is basically no. The helium's in the crystal. Once it gets out of the crystal, it's able to get out of the rock entirely. It seems to be concentrated in the crystals, which okay. right, the only place that could generate the helium, it's in the crystal as well. Okay. So those so are a couple me, of good young earth indicators, I think, on, on the side of geology. So can I ask you this real quick, uh, Dr. Ross, yeah. whenever the helium escapes, is it possible for other rocks to absorb that helium and give kind of false, you know, uh, numbers in, in the sense? Uh, not really. Uh, in, okay. in part because helium itself is, has never to that point been used as an age indicator. Uh, the helium that uranium makes in making lead looks just like every other helium. So if I had a collected group of helium, I'd have no idea what made it, whether it was radioactive. Uh, I mean, we know all the helium comes from radioactive decay, um, sure. but at the same time, I wouldn't know from where that came from. I, I wouldn't know which rock it came from. So the crystals that they were sampling are called zircons and they're found inside biotite. Biotite is a type of mica. It's, a, it's that you know, flaky, glittery type of rock. It's, it's mm -hmm. black. Uh, and peels okay. apart easily. Once the yeah. helium gets in there, it escapes really fast because uh, biotite has got some very easy kind of, you know, stacks and the helium can move through the stacks very, okay. very quickly. 
Right on. So, right on. Yeah. Right on. So what I'm what I'm hearing here is that you know, yes, the young earth position has problems, but so does the other other guys. You know, there are problems across the board that we're still trying to figure out. Oh yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's well put, David, because everybody finds themselves, uh, my wife likes to say, everybody finds themselves with certain types of tensions. You know, all of us in our walk for Christianity and for those who are of other faiths and beliefs, we all walk in certain types of tensions. For the Christian, uh, the, the greatest tension is that, you know, Christ's kingdom has come and yet it is not yet complete, right? right. And we, we live now, the church age is an age of tension where Christ has become victorious, and yet the full consummation of that has not yet been seen. Inaugurated eschatology. <laughs> That's right. That's yeah. right. And Us, so, you know, yeah. for, for young earth creationists, we have uh, some significant scientific issues. I think we have a very, very strong theological structure to yeah. us. Um, and I think other views, old earth creationism has uh, maybe some stronger aspects on science for age of the earth, but you have to live with some other kinds of tensions theologically. And you have some tensions with say evidence for evolution or a few of the niggling problems that the young earthers show up. And same thing for a theistic evolutionists. They've got, you know, they can say we, we claim the mantle of conventional science, but the interpretive approach to Genesis ends up becoming rather tricky to yeah, do. Right. Um, so do you think that maybe we're all wrong and we're just, there's somewhere in the middle there that we could be. There's elements know, of truth there, in all right? of them. Yeah, <laughs> this is what I try to do, and, and I tell people this all the time. Is and Tyler, I, this is a, a pure example of what I was trying to say when we started this whole series was like, look, on these type of issues, I don't claim a hard stance on any of them because, you know. There could I don't want to be tied to it. You know what I mean? I, mm -hmm. I you know, I want to go where the evidence leads, you know, however, who, who, who am I to say that I'm even interpreting some of the evidence, right? You know, this and that. So, I mean, there's yeah. a lot of, of, of sure. issues all around that I yeah. see. And this is why I don't like to, you know, totally take a view. Cause I, I think there is truth to that, you know, Hey, we, we may be, all missing a certain aspect and I don't want to take such a hard line because there could be truth right here in the middle, you know? So anyways, that's kind of like where I was going with that. Absolutely. But Tyler, do you want to follow up with anything else on that question or do you well, actually, so I just got a few more questions. I know we're about to hit the hour mark, but I, I just want to put yeah, throw those out there real quick. Uh, but, but I'll let you go first. Well, let's get to uh wow. For some reason, my screen just got really, really blue, but Anyway, uh, Dane, actually, our friend Dane has a question here. Uh, Dr. Ross, can you ask our uh, Dane ask, can you ask Dr. Ross about trees which grow through multiple strata of rock at Grand Canyon or other places? Isn't this evidence that the layers are not millions of years old? What is the old earth scientific explanation for this, if any? That's a that's a great question. And uh, thank you, Dane, for for bringing it up. So these types of fossils where you've got something like a tree that's vertical through several layers of rock um, have often been referred to as polystrate fossils, poly meaning many and straight referring to strata. So they go through many layers of strata. And I've seen some of these in the field. Uh, I remember when I was at Penn State in my undergraduate, we went to an old coal uh, quarry and uh, there was like this four and a half foot tall tree trunk that was just sticking straight up with like this root ball sort of thing in, in the rock at the bottom and mm -hmm. going through, you know, some layers that had eroded away, but it was, you know, clearly something that had gone through several layers of rock. And I remember right. sketching that in my notebook because I'm like, <laughs> this is an interesting observation, right? So yeah. I got to put this in. So what these what these types of, of rocks or what these types of features in the rock show us is that there had to be rapid deposition of the rock units through which they cut. So this is not something that actually shows you that the earth is young. This okay. isn't something that shows you that the geological column is actually all made at once or something like that. What it does show you is that for the example that I mentioned here is that maybe six feet worth of rock or maybe more. I don't know when, how far that tree would have actually gone. I, I saw it up to four feet. But okay. uh, for however many layers of rock that tree sticks through, those layers would have had to have been made basically simultaneously because mm -hmm. a, a tree is not going to sit for... 500 years where it's rotted at the bottom and still standing as layers of sediment bury it. 
um, right. vertically. The trees just, they rot, they fall over, they die, right? And you wouldn't have a fossil record. Yeah. You know, you just have some carbonized little bits of coal and, and whatnot around. So for these for these units, what they do is they show us that there has been rapid sedimentation in those units. Uh, so I want to be careful and not say that, oh, yeah, therefore, you know, geology has shown that Noah's flood happened. No, because the old Earth explanation for this could be that there was a localized catastrophe. A tsunami came through and, you know, buried a whole bunch of trees at the margin of a swamp like in Louisiana. And so they're still thinking that this is swampy area, whatever. And you just buried a whole bunch of things real quick. And then later, a new forest grew on top of those. So you can incorporate catastrophe within old earth geology. The, mm -hmm. Those two are not mutually exclusive. And for many, many years in those, those dawning periods of the beginning of an ancient age of the earth in the 1800s, for example, people were still catastrophists. They believed that catastrophes, even God-directed catastrophes, were the main way that geology was produced. It wasn't until Hutton in 1875, and it's more especially Lyell in the 1830s, uh, sorry, 1795, and, and Lyell in 1830s uh, that started saying that no, slow gradual processes are the only thing that we can use in order to explain the geological record. And the, so the pendulum swung from Noah's flood as a giant catastrophe that does everything to a bunch of catastrophes over time that did stuff, but over long periods of time to only slow and gradual processes Okay. operating over long periods of time. And by the yeah. time you get to the 1960s in the United States, this this pendulum had swung so far that people just couldn't think about catastrophes at all, except for a few creationists and a few other oddball old earth folks. Yeah. And they started swinging the pendulum a little bit back towards the middle to allow for catastrophe. And uh, I remember being at a Geological Society of America meeting and Stephen Austin, a young earth creationist, not Stone Cold and not some of the other guys, <laughs> Steve Austin, young earth creationist, um, was being talked about by one of the presenters who's an old earth, as to my knowledge, evolutionary guy. And I was amazed at what he said. He said, Steve Austin was 20 years ahead of his time in thinking about catastrophic processes. We are only now coming to think in the ways that, you know, basically he was thinking. And he's like, and I, I don't agree with the, with the young earth thing or anything, but Steve Austin was willing to look at the geological column with fresh eyes and think, did this happen slow and gradual? And he yeah. saw most things. The answer was no. And now the geological community is much more open to what they would call episodic events, small okay. scale catastrophes, even large scale catastrophes. I mean, the extinction of the dinosaurs by an, by an asteroid yeah. is a massive catastrophic argument that right. was unthinkable in the 1960s and 70s, became highly controversial in the 80s and 90s, and mm -hmm. now is considered the only explanation, right? And right. that's the that pendulum has swung a little bit from, you know, only gradualism to, okay, we can allow catastrophes as long as there's, you know, an ancient earth backdrop to them. Gotcha. So catastrophism is not off the table. No, it's not. Uh, okay. In fact, uh, uh, a well-known ca catastrophic old earth geologist is Derek Ager. Uh, and he once quipped that the life of, of the geological record is a lot like the life of a soldier long periods of boredom mm. followed by a few moments of sheer terror. And wow. uh, he looked at geology in the same way. He was writing in the 1970s and 80s and, and 90s, and he was seeing catastrophes everywhere from an old earth perspective. He didn't like the fact that young earthers loved what he was writing. Yeah, <laughs> he right. Out of them. Uh, yeah. But he was seeing neat stuff. Awesome. Right. So, you you know, what I'm hearing here, which kind of scares me for a, even a... a it, a worldwide flood though is that we even though we have these deposits of where this catastrophe can happen it's not a global thing yet i mean how do you explain like desert deposits right uh how mm -hmm. do you reconcile independent lines of evidence that converge to show that old redstone uh old redstone sandstones almost certainly formed over thousands and thousands of years in a dry climate and not any kind of flood catastrophe yeah, I, you know, the deserts argument is is a potential defeater, right? Because uh, right. Noah's flood is not going to make deserts. 
Yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. Deserts and watery destruction of the planet just don't, you know, those two don't they seem don't to work. <laughs> and uh, so in the in the Grand Canyon, and uh, I remember yeah, in one of your questions, like, why does everybody talk about the Grand Canyon? You know, the young Earth right. and the yeah. old Earth folks, they everybody points to the Grand Canyon. I think the reason why uh, is basically this. It's the only place that anybody thinks about geology from a popular level. Yeah. I mean, here you and I are living in the Appalachians and, you know, I could I could give a talk about uh, the geology of the of the limestones in the Shenandoah Valley. Where? And, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But when when you say Grand Canyon, when you say Rocky Mountains, when you say Mount Rushmore of the Black Hills, people have an idea of geology. So mm -hmm. one of the reasons why the focus has always been on the Grand Canyon is because you can see all the rocks. One of the terrible things about living out here in the East Coast, it's all this biology, you know, <laughs> it's, it's infesting all of the good rocks and I can't <laughs> see anything. Um, so, but you go out West and it's it, the rocks are there because yeah. there's no life. So let's take a look at, at one of the examples in the Grand Canyon that's supposed to be a defeater for, for a global flood. That's the, uh, a, a unit of rock called the Coconino Sandstone. So sandstone is just like what it sounds like. It is a rock made of sand grains, you know, and there's a, a bunch of writing about the, the Coconino sandstone going back to the early 1900s, saying that it has lots of evidence of being a desert sand dune, just like the Sahara. You've got in the Sahara, you've got these dunes. And when dunes form, the I'll kind of put it out this way, the sand climbs up on the long end of the dune, and then you've got the drop side and the sand then falls down in this line. And uh, as the sand dune migrates, it usually leaves some of this behind it. Like, you know, if, if we have another one over here, it kind of rides over top of it and leaves some of these lines over here behind. So these are called, called cross beds and they're called cross beds because they're beds, they're layers that go across from the normal horizontal surface. So most of the time in geology for sediments, you make horizontal surfaces. These cross beds are dune slip faces okay mm -hmm. just like that and so you make these lines worth of sand in them and the argument has been that those um, cross beds in the coconino sand stone look like sahara style dunes and uh the sand is very well rounded and it's very um uh it's very well sorted which is what happens when wind blows sand and not what happens when water moves it. Water can move a lot of different size things. Wind can only move certain stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's like, you know, five, six indicators. Coconino sandstone was made in a dune deposit. There's marine below, there's marine above, and in between the two marine, you've got the Sahara. So sorry, young earth creationists, you guys lose. And that is a hard argument then. Hang up the hat. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, obviously you, you have you have uh you know reason to accept young earth still right yeah. i mean still well, just because just because there's maybe lines of evidence that you know we haven't reached a conclusion or or you haven't you know oh but but here's where anything. the story gets better okay. because yeah, right. uh, geologist dr john whitmore he teaches at cedarville university has been working on the coconino sandstone for the last 20 years taking yeah. scores of students out there collecting samples measuring the rock etc and uh, there's a, a really good, just for the lay folks, a good summary of his work um, on answers in Genesis. And I can uh, text you guys the um, uh, the link to that so you can put that down below where he you goes. Spoke, through these. You, you just spoke the unforgivable phrase to David. <laughs> Uh, right. in Genesis. No, I'm just kidding. I, Go ahead. Sorry. Right. But, and, and I know, you know, answers in Genesis can be grouchy. John <laughs> was not a grouchy guy. And uh, you know, so this was an article that he wrote. Yeah. Uh, describing the research that he's been doing over the years here. And he has systematically measured hundreds and hundreds of those cross beds, right? And it turns out that the angle of those cross beds do not look like sand dunes mm -hmm. from the Sahara. They're lower angle, which look like underwater sand waves. So think of a dune that's migrating underwater. Okay. And in order to make those, the water velocities up at the surface have got to be kicking and they've got to be yeah. moving fast. So this, the, um, the cross beds, yeah, when you stand there and you kind of look at the rock, you just think that they're really steep. When you get up and you actually measure them like he has, uh -huh. they're not as steep as what you think. It's an optical illusion. And he's taken more measurements than any human being on earth uh, with sure. this, hundreds of locations. The sand grains 
are not nearly as well rounded as you think. When you when you use the same the same process that the uh, the guy who made the first argument for this, uh, he went through and said, here are all the indicators. Here's how you judge roundedness versus angular fragments and things like that. And from his analysis, he said the coconino is this. He used the same methods John Whitmore did. It's like, no, no, no. We've looked at thousands of samples of the coconino sand grains um, under the microscope, and they're not well-rounded. They're sub-rounded to somewhat angular, which doesn't look like sand dunes. That looks like beach sand. That looks like underwater sand. Moreover, mm -hmm. there's some things in that sand. So we we think sand, and we usually think quartz because quartz is the most durable, one of the more durable materials out there. It makes yeah. up most of sand. But sand is actually a size category, and in the Coconino sandstone is not just quartz. There's two other things that ought not be there if this was made in a desert dune: mica, that thin, flaky mineral. This stuff is like powder, um, and it's in there. And dolomite, which is also a, um, that's actually a marine created um, mineral. It's not created on land at all. It's made in the marine realm. And these two super soft minerals are actually in the mix of all this hard quartz where he's gone, uh, Whitmore has gone out to, to modern dunes next to beaches that are only a couple hundred yards away from, uh, from the water. And he has systematically sampled from the water's edge all the way through these dunes out to about a mile away and said, you know, where do we lose the mica? And we lose the mica in the first couple hundred yards. Mm. And so if we're talking about a desert sand dune, mica doesn't exist in those things. Right. He's gone to the Nebraska sand dunes and taken samples of the Nebraska sand dunes. There's no mica over there. The cross beds are different. The sand is well-rounded. It looks different from the Coconino. So when you take a look at all these things that were used and are still talked about in standard textbooks right now, that says the Coconino sandstone is a Sahara dune in the middle of the Grand Canyon and young earthers lose. Not at John all. Whitmore, over 20 years has demolished every one of these arguments. The Coconino sandstone is a gigantic, I mean, hundreds of, of, uh, thousands and thousands of square miles worth of area. It's this enormous underwater dune field, which when you ask, are there any processes around today that are making something like that? The answer is no, there are no modern environments. Yep, there are no modern environments <laughs> that a uniformitarian geologist can point to where these things are being made. But in our simulations, we know that they can be made under deep water conditions. And even in the modern, they're made in deep water conditions, just not large volumes of them. So this looks like wow. Noah's blood is explaining yeah. the rocks that were supposed to be unexplainable. All right. Well, Dr. Ross, you know, we're pushing um, Thank over you, an hour. Ross. And you know what? I appreciate that you revived my uh, uh, co-host's faith in young earth creationism it's really it never good died. to see what him are you talking about to see him all happy because he was looking really frustrated as we were bringing in all these other people and you know well, when you I, hear the same I'm thing over that, and over again yeah, you do well, kind of get yeah. frustrated and, and i do and, and just just to know there there's very many aspects to explore you know and i, yeah. I wanted to yes. i Agreed. wanted to bring you on because i knew you'd be able to uh show that to us you and know you and i really it. appreciate appreciate that um even though i still hold to obviously an old earth there's several other reasons and we haven't been able to even to scratch the surface i mean honestly Part i mean two. i'm sure you Part can admit two. we haven't even <laughs> we haven't been able to scratch the surface oh well, yeah uh yeah. yeah and that's the thing is like and i wish i wish there was a medium where people actually debated these new findings that support your view which uh i think it's unfair that you guys just get put over in, in some subcategory where people just ignore your your science and stuff like that. I think that's a real shame. And, and I hope that at Faith Unaltered, we were able to bring that to the table. Like next week, we're going to have a naturalist, a young earth, a Bill Hosk, right? That's how oh, you yeah. say it. Bill Hosk. Uh, Hosk. 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 Yeah. Hosk, yeah. Hosk, yeah. And uh, Dr. Uh, um, um, Joseph Joe Miller, Miller again. Yep. Which uh, is interesting. To talk which is very interesting because Dr. Bill Hosh and Dr. Uh, Joe Miller actually taught at the same school. So that'll oh, be cool to have two colleagues kind of get together that are yeah. on separate sides of the table to actually get together and interact. So make sure yeah. you guys catch that. Uh, yes, absolutely. But yeah, I mean, you know, 
uh, I know everybody was getting barred because we 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 did have a lot of old old Earth guys come on to try to to talk about you know old earth and and stuff like that i'm just very glad that you came on to discuss with us uh about this and and as well and we're honored again to have you uh tyler do you want to follow up with anything else i i you know well, i know i know we need a part two dr ross so if you'd like to come back and do a part two we'd love it that'd be delightful um that's awesome our and i hope we were nice enough it. I hope we were nice enough, just like I told you we were going to try to be, you know, oh, nice yeah, enough, right. you know, so I hey, hope you had a good time. Absolutely. <laughs> it's Christ all, it's well. the body of Christ right here. This is great. And uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, from the science side, you know, there's plenty of other things that uh, I could have talked about in some of the presentations I do. There's interesting young earth arguments for uh, for things like bioturbation, which is when animals are stirring up the sediment, uh, sediment and what you expect with an old earth versus what you expect with a young earth on these sorts of things. Uh, okay. Stuff like the preservation of shell material and what you expect from an old earth versus a young earth and where the, the paleontological data lie on that and some fascinating stuff involving footprints and space in the rocks between when footprints are made and when the first appearance of the feet show up like, okay, we got dinosaur footprints, but we don't have any dinosaurs around. Why, why don't we have any dinosaur fossils when we've got dinosaur footprints? Uh, you know, just interesting stuff like that. And, you know, obviously tonight we didn't get a chance to talk very much about the theological issues. So, you know, maybe in, maybe in a follow-up we can go through and say, all right, so, you know, what are, the, what are the areas of strength and tension uh, that yeah. we see in, in young earth versus old earth uh, sort of stuff there as well? Yeah, so um, we'll definitely keep you on it. our network, you know, of people to cool. contact, to talk about if you're willing, you know. Um, again, like I said, we'd love to have you for part two in the future. Maybe we'll do another creation series down the down the road right now. Tyler, what are we getting into next? We're actually getting, so we're going to take a little pause. We've got a couple miscellaneous episodes we're going to do. And then after that, our next series is going to be answering Jewish objections about Jesus. So we're wow. diving into what the rabbis are saying. We're diving into maybe even aspects of the Talmud. And, and just bringing, we, man, after really getting into the Torah observant discussion and then having our good friend Rob Solberg debate, debate Rabbi Tovia Singer, we just, Dave and I both at the end of that had really have a heart for reaching uh, Jewish people, right? I mean, these, these are our older brothers and sisters, man. You know what I'm saying? That Christianity stems from Judaism, right? And so we want to see our Jewish brothers and sisters. I mean, we want to see them come to Christ. And so David and I both have a heart for the Jewish people and we want to answer some of those objections about their Messiah. I mean, this is Jesus, their Messiah as well as ours. Right. So that's our next series. And I'm really excited to get into that. Absolutely. And plus we're going to show up some tour observers. So, you know, that's always fun. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. But anyways, again, uh, uh, Dr. Ross, where, where can people find you uh, yes. when uh, at the end of the day when they're looking to research and do stuff like that? Where they can they find your uh, material and so forth? Oh, well, thanks. Uh, one of the uh, one of the things that I've been privileged to be able to do is write a textbook along with uh, Dr. John Whitmore, uh, Dr. Danny Faulkner and Dr. Stephen Golmer. Uh, it's a textbook called The Heavens and the Earth. And uh, we use that as our introductory earth science class uh, textbook at Cedarville University, Liberty University, Patrick Henry College uses it, uh, the Master's University, some high schools around the country uh, use it as well for, for an advanced earth science class. Uh, so that's that's a, a neat resource. Um, I've, I've written some things here and there. You can find uh, oh, almost a dozen articles from me at uh, Answers Magazine. Um, I haven't written for Answers in Genesis in quite a while. Don't tell them, you know, but uh, I, I think that's I think dinosaurs did. feathers, you know, and that's, oh, that's a, oh yeah. That? Dinosaurs, have feathers. dinosaurs have feathers. That's, that's some fun have. tension within young earth creationism right now. And, um, it's, but, uh, but I've, I've written a number of different articles there. Um, you know, there's, there's a few things out there on YouTube. You mentioned uh, the debate with Mike Jones. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a couple other things and now your, your program. Thank you guys for having me. And uh, you can always find uh, find a way to, to reach me and find out some of the talks that I might uh, give if you head over to Cornerstone uh, Educational Supplies website. And uh, that's cornerstone-edsupply.com, cornerstone-edsupply.com. And if you click on, you know, like the About Us or whatever, you'll, you'll get to a, a page where I've got a number of different lectures and stuff like that. So if people are interested in, you know, having me uh, come over for church or do a, a video thing or something like that, those are some places uh, where I'm active. 
Um, also got a few things in in uh, kind of the theology side. My sister has dragged me a little bit more into uh, discussions with the theologians. So with in addition to the book that comes out in 2023, um, I've got a couple of chapters in uh, the Zondervan uh, Dictionary of Christianity and Science. So I, I uh, have a couple of articles on Noah's flood and uh, evidence for young earth uh, nice. in that and uh, not too many. Uh, but uh, a couple of couple of articles in there. So those are some places where you can find out a little bit of what I, what I do. Okay. Right on, right on. We really appreciate, uh, again, yes. you coming on and, and discussing with us. And, and as I said before, guys, this wasn't about arguing with Dr. Ross, David versus Dr. Ross, or, or David versus Tyler and Dr. Ross. Like, no you know, we, we, had, we had fun with me and Dane enough, you know. We wanted to get the information out there, what yep. the young Earths actually believe from a scientific point of view. And I think yeah. we got that tonight. Are you agree, Tyler? Uh, 100%. Yeah, 100%. Awesome. Yeah, I feel awesome. like we're sitting around a table eating chips and chatting. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but anyways, Tyler, uh, if you want to take us home, I will back out and let you uh, close us out. Absolutely. And just another, again, Dr. Ross, thank you so much. It was an honor. It was a pleasure to dialogue and talk with you about these things. Join us next week for our listeners. We've got the panel discussion, as David was talking about, Dr. Bill Hosh. Or, I'm sorry, not doctor. He, he's got his master's. Uh, Bill Hosh, he's from the Mount St. Helens Creation Center. So you can find just Google Mount St. Helens Creation Center and you can find everything from him. We've got Dr. Joseph Miller again back with us uh, from More Than Cake, right? That's his podcast <laughs> website, More Than Cake. I love it. So for those who don't know what More Than Cake is, go check out the episode that we did with Dr. Miller. He explains uh, exactly what More Than Cake is, and I just found that just absolutely fascinating. So check that out. And then, uh, David, who did you say? Our uh, Jordan. Jordan Crib. He's been out. out. Yep, he's been on. Uh, PRA several times be his first time I think on uh, Faith Unaltered but same guys <laughs> yep yeah actually he hosted he he's did awesome. uh, one of your guest co-hosts he's a nuclear uh, he's a he's a, uh, a nuclear physicist so like our nuclear engineer so I mean it's really yeah. cool to have him on and the reason I wanted him on was to go over you know radiometric dating and stuff like yeah. that because he he knows a lot about it so right um yeah so so we'll have all three of those gentlemen on uh, next week with us at 7 p.m. Same channel. Uh, you can find us on YouTube and Facebook. And then the week after, we're going to have my Calvinist brothers and sisters. All right. Well, just brothers uh, on this one to talk. So we had Will Hess from the church split to talk about theories of the atonement a couple weeks ago. And so my Calvinist friends heard it. They're going to come back and give a foundation for penal substitutionary atonement. Uh, one of the aspects of the atonement that Will didn't seem too, too friendly on, but he did hold to substitutionary atonement. So I can, I can vouch with him on that one. Uh, but, but I do have a uh, Jeremiah, uh, the black doctor coming back on to discuss penal substitutionary atonement and a fresh face uh, from, uh, from one of my friends, uh, on Facebook, he'll be on to join us as well for the first time on faith on altar. So we got a whole bunch of stuff coming back at you. And then on the 21st, yep. we've got Dr. Tim Stratton and, uh, Chris date from rethinking hell to come on to talk about determinism and Molinism. And so we've laid the foundation for both of them. Now it's time to get the two head to head interacting with each other. This won't be a debate. This is not going to be any kind of formal debate. This is an informal discussion between the two. So Dave and I'll be jumping in asking questions. I know they've got questions for each other. And so that will be a really fun time. But after that, you can expect the answering Jewish objections to Jesus. Yep. And well, man, don't, don't forget, hey, we're gonna do don't, after that. forget don't forget our Halloween stuff. Hey, that's one. <laughs> Dr. Ross, before you go, I've got to ask you just one more question work, real quick. Where do you stand on the whole aliens thing? Like, like, are, are there aliens? Are they angels? What in the world? Because we're actually you're talking about the record. Well, that's true. But we're actually having Dr. Hugh Ross. To come back. When is that? When is that, bro? Do uh, October what? 21st? 28th. We're going to have 28th. 28th. Uh, and okay. I'm also working another one for the paranormal on yes. probably that same weekend. Demonologist. So. so, yeah. So where do you stand? <laughs> Aliens, angels, non-existent. What are they? Uh, my suspicion is no aliens. Okay. Interstellar transport is, uh, is just an unbelievably large hurdle. Um, but on the other hand, uh, I try not to think about it too much because I enjoy sci-fi, and yeah. you know I start thinking Fair about it, I don't enjoy my sci-fi anymore. So that's right, no, right? Uh, it's depressing. <laughs> and uh, the reality is, 
you know, if you if you press me on it, no, there's no aliens. They're, okay. they're certainly not visiting here, and they have no interest in us. Uh, and probes. <laughs> I mean, why would they really? Come on, guys. Touche. Uh, human, human beings are altogether too eager to tell everybody everything about themselves. You don't need probes. Yeah. <laughs> Aunt Sally's that's just right. going to tell you all the gossip anyway. She'll tell you everything you want to know and more. That's right. There you go. There right you on, go. Right on. right on. But other than that, y'all, thank again, Dr. Ross, thank you so much. It's been so much fun just talking with you for the past hour and a half now. I loved it and I've learned a lot. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, most, any guys, thank you guys. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Any, any final words? Hey, you know, I, I, I appreciate the uh, the offer to be here and uh, wish you the, the best. You've got a really fascinating lineup coming up over here. That's really interesting stuff. So congratulations on snagging great ideas and some great people to talk with uh, about. Yes. Them. So, God uh, has blessed us in that area for sure. For sure. Absolutely. So hopefully I'll be uh, tuning in and catching a few of these episodes. Please Absolutely. do. Please do. And for our listeners, please like, share, subscribe. You all, we, we rely on y'all to get our content out and about. And so we're, we're completely uh, listener supported. And so we really appreciate our listeners for that. But until next time, God bless, good night, and definitely stay like Christ. <laughs>